I was in work at Costa Coffee. My friend James rang me on the phone and was like, your letter's here. And I was like, oh, there we go, make a break. And I tried to finish work. I was like, let me go home for like an hour. And they wouldn't let me go home. So um, I said to my friend James, I was like, mate, you need to bring that up here. So he, he um, walked a good 45 minutes to bring it up to me. Um, I just remember opening it in the kitchen um, at Costa and just literally breaking down on my knees. Just, there we go, that's what I've been kind of waiting for. The reason why I kind of wanted to do my MA is because I did the academic side at uni, but I also wanted the drama school training. I was very naive in thinking, ah, oh, it's fine, 12 grand for the tuition fees, oh, so I can live in London, blah, blah, blah. Then when my dad sat me down and was like, no, look at this, that's a good 20 grand that you need to pay us. That's 12,000 pounds for the tuition fees. And it says between six and nine grand just for living costs, for equipment, living in London, for paying your rent and everything else. And that's when it kind of dawned on me going, all right, dad, you're right. So unfortunately I had to defer my place for a year. And that's when I moved to London. I got a job as a chef um, and from there, um, I kind of worked my way up to kind of earn a bit more money, so I was on £7.50 an hour rather than the minimum wage. Um, and from there I kind of saved and saved and saved and saved. It just wasn't enough. Even after a year of saving, I think I saved just shy of six, seven grand maybe. So it came to the second open day, fell in love with the school over again. I felt like I was torturing myself. So then I got my second deferral after speaking to the lecturers. Um, and from there, I was like, I'm going to save and save and save. And just got to Christmas time and I was like, I'm just chasing a dream I'm never going to afford. My parents couldn't afford it. I clearly couldn't afford it with my minimum wage job, even with the £7.50. Working 50 hours a week for a year. I tried everything in my power and it didn't work. That was the realisation for me to kind of go, something needs to be done. Hello guys! Hello. 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 So, I'm going to be your host this evening, uh, I'll be introducing all the acts. Um, just kind of give you people who don't know what actor awareness is, we fight for equality and diversity in the industry uh, for working class actors. Um, now working class is a big part of my life, um, I got into drama school and as Nick said, couldn't afford to kind of go, so um, unfortunately I, I kind of got a bit rowdy on Twitter and blogs and started shouting my mouth off and people kind of took to it. I started getting my friends just take pictures of I support actor awareness of the placards. Once that started going, more people started to find out about the campaign. And then the first a big person to do it was Boise from Under Fools and Horses. Now he's was like my childhood hero, along with Del Boy, the whole kind of Under Fools and Horses cast. That's a massive thing for me.
I got an article written about me in the, in the stage saying that actor awareness would be nothing more than just a hashtag. Luckily, it didn't, but if enough people read that, that can ruin a company. That sort of media, as a small scale company, can literally just flatten you like that. And that's when I realized this is a class thing. This is definitely a class thing. ITV got in contact after they'd seen a couple of my tweets and saw that I was getting a bit of publicity. And it's not about presumably bashing actors who are doing brilliant at, at the Oscars no. and BAFTAs, but just giving no, everybody an opportunity. You can't win a race if you're 200 metres behind. And then the BBC came on board and wanted to do an interview with me on BBC Radio 5 Live, which was like, oh, I, the first thing I thought was like, that's my dad's favourite radio station. Are you down here in London and finding you've got no contacts, no money and no hope? Oh, 100%. I mean, you got to think, you got to pay £50 plus to an audition to the drama school. Yep. That's a massive issue as it is. Mm -hmm. Then you got to pay the fees. Um, and then when you come out of drama school, you're still not guaranteed that agent at the end of the showcase. So, actor awareness was kind of officially off Twitter now. We'd had, I think it was about three meetings now uh, down in the Phoenix Artist Club. My dad went to, my dad's not a very big theatre goer, um, just, didn't, just didn't really appeal to him, uh, which is fine, but the other day, by choice, he decided to go see a show. Now, it was, it was in the Lowry up in Manchester, and it was about the rivalry between uh, Manchester City fans and Manchester United fans, and how the rivalries kind of stemmed from that, which is a really good little show. Uh, and he went to go see that by choice. Now, that really struck a chord in me, and going, if my dad who's not been to the theatre in 20 years can go and watch a show because he, can, he feels he can relate to it, that was like, well, that's what I should do. So I should go into communities with a writer from that community or, or, or whatever and get people in that community onto the stage and tell them their stories. What I'm trying to do is not just build a campaign, but build a network of people, build a network of, of a community, a family that we can all call upon each other whenever we want and we're all more than happy to help. The Guardian then approached me. We're just going to do a little article on working class actors. On the Sunday, it was in The Observer, and it was this huge, just four-page spread. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is happening. This is, this is going to happen. It just opened so many more doors. Twitter just went through the roof. Facebook went through the roof. Followers were coming in every single day. I met Tom uh, online via Twitter when I became aware of the uh, hashtag and the campaign that he started for Actors Awareness. I believe in it. I have 100% faith in Actors Awareness. I think the industry is suffering because it's become very exclusive and actually arts should be inclusive. And I think the points he's making are absolutely valid. There are a lot of fairly high profile actors with plummy accents from public schools. And they're very good actors. And they've won a lot of BAFTAs. And therefore, you've got people saying, are all the actors now from Eton or Harrow? Um, of course, that's not true. Of course, there are lots of brilliant actors who come from state schools and they're in television, they're in film, they're on stage. But anecdotally, there's some truth in the fact that a number of the talented actors winning awards and getting lead parts are indeed from the 7%, that small minority that go to private schools. And I think it's absolutely the case that the small number of people from the 7% of private schools uh, get more opportunity. I think the most difficult thing for working class actors is, um, for me personally, it's usually the travel to auditions. And the very beginning was the start of having to pay for auditions for drama school because uh, I paid I think about £45 per audition and it, it's so hard obviously to get into drama school anyway so you, you can't just go for one audition you have to go for five I think minimum to give yourself a good chance and to relax into the what what it is is the what is the audition process. To get in a drama school now you need money to, uh, 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 to an extent that when I went to drama school, you did not. Um, you're excluded if you don't have money, which is true of everything in our society. 
at the moment? I had two offers for um, a foundation course at Italia Conti. Um, I've had that two years on the run and I've had to turn it down two years on the run due to the fact that I don't have the money. Um, both times it was very bittersweet because it's in a in a environment where you don't get a lot of recalls, there's a lot of rejection, to suddenly get that offer of the foundation course is in one way exhilarating, but in another way, I'll be honest, both years it absolutely broke my heart to turn it down because I felt like, I felt a bit like I failed because I didn't have money. I didn't have thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds to to do that course for a year. I went to drama school, but I I got a scholarship from the Daily Mail to go to drama school and they've paid for all my fees and I'm very often about this and my maintenance it was the Patricia Rothermere Award which was I was nominated for for RADA so you know luckily you know I I got that there was no way I could have gone and I think it's got worse and worse now. When I made the phone call to them both years to turn them down I felt like, and maybe I shouldn't have been like this, but I felt like I was really apologetic on the phone. Like, and I was really down about it, but I felt very much like, not like they're gonna be angry at me, but they're gonna be, that I'm turning down an opportunity. Like I felt guilty about it. When really I didn't have anything to feel guilty about because it's not my fault that I don't have the money. It's not my fault that they're charging that much. For me personally, I don't think I could have I could have probably afforded drama school. Um, looking back now at like the fees and stuff, definitely not. And 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 moving to the area where they are as well, and paying rents there and paying travels there and and stuff. And you kind of I suppose a lot of people work at, at, at the same time and, and have to graft at the kind of part time job just to fund the the dream. Um, so yeah, it definitely is harder for for working class actors to make it um, you know I mean my mum and dad have always worked hard and always we've always had nice things growing up holidays and, and, and things like that and I've always kind of you know had nice things for Christmas and birthdays and, and things like that but I couldn't imagine turning around and asking my mum and dad for X amount of money for, for, for drama school tuition fees and things like that because they just, they just don't have it. I remember talking to this one person it was like they Quite, couldn't quite comprehend the fact that I didn't have the money for a foundation course. I was like, you know, I, I said to them, you know, I don't have the money for it. And she was like, well, you know, can't you, you know, go to this or do this or can't your parents help you? And I'm like, no, they don't have the money either. And it was just kind of very much like blank look. We have to believe that acting is a craft that would like to be an art, if that doesn't sound too pretentious. If we believe that you can, you can be good at it, but you can be better, then we have to make training as affordable as possible to as wide a range of people as possible. If you imagine the top table of the industry is a nightclub, and it's completely exclusive, but they're saying, you can come in. We want you to queue you outside. You can definitely come and join us, but you're never going to be allowed in. They just want you queuing. Sometimes you can't afford the £500 showreel. You can't afford um, £50 for the audition time after time after time again. Um, you can't afford the tuition fees. You can't afford the spotlight. You can't afford equity. You've got generations being created now who simply can afford to go to a drama school, as opposed to have the right talent for it. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that kids from a certain background aren't talented, of course they are, but they can't be the only people getting work. And currently, unfortunately, they are. There are a number of obstacles and barriers to people entering the acting industry or the performance industry or the creative arts, whatever it is we want to call them. Um, and it just feels like currently those barriers are more numerous than they were. Um, and they are tied up in things like drama school fees, the cost of having your 
profile on Spotlight and casting called Pro, and these are all fee-paying services that we have to use. Um, and so it just means that if you're somebody like myself who grew up in a in a deprived household, in a deprived area, then there's not much chance for you to, to succeed. The, the odds are really stacked against you. The headshots is a massive battle for any actor, is making sure that you have the best of the best and they don't come cheaply. I know that some photo shoots can be up to £600 just for an indoor and an outdoor shoot, but there's so many people that just get really really low quality headshots just because that's all that they can afford and it's so detrimental like people pick up a headshot and they just go yeah no no one of the biggest things that i have noticed since leaving drama school is that the acting world expects you to be at its beck and call so you may whether or not you have an agent you may get an email one day saying hey are you available for an audition tomorrow at 12 p.m. in this place in London. Now, unless you are someone who has the luxury of not being able to work, often meeting those demands is not very realistic because, you know, you're probably working or there are things that you can't get out of. So what I'm finding is a lot of people who are actually able to make auditions and to spend the time writing and applying for auditions or you know, writing to theatre companies to send their headshots out, that's like a full-time job in itself. Being available, constantly hustling for work is something that takes a lot of time. So one big barrier that I'm finding is the only people who are actually able to kind of push themselves and to make all those auditions and to hustle are the ones who are able to not work and generally they tend to be the ones with parental support or uh, independent wealth. I think it's a truth that at any given time 80 or 90 percent of the acting profession is out of work because of course they're freelancers and they're between jobs. Uh, if you are working in a very casualised industry, you, particularly when you're starting, you need assistance. If you don't have that assistance, which I'm going to call the bank of mum and dad, then how are you going to get on in the acting profession when you may have two, three months when you're not working and when you need support? I don't have a huge savings from when I was born behind me. I have no savings. All the money I have is what I get paid monthly. So I guess in some ways it can be harder. But I don't play the victim, and I don't like people to think just because my background or the person that I am, things are harder. Life's hard regardless. So, like, I'll work in a little cafe um, that I'm lucky enough to just be able to go back into. Uh, but so many people can't, and they have to take a contract with a job, and then you lose out on auditions, and then your agent gets fed up that you can't go, and. And it's just, it's just like a vicious cycle all the time. It's just money, money, money all the time. <laughs> you know, I'm trying very hard not to fall into that trap of getting a, say, a, another bar job or something like that. And I've seen it happen to friends where it's, overtake, it's overtaken their life in the sense that they're, they're not going to auditions because they have to work because they don't want to lose that job. The working class actors that I've been around and I've studied with and I've worked with and I've grown up with, they fall off the map because every year that goes by they think, oh no, I'm that one year older and money starts to become far more important. As working class actors, if we don't make it, then we're screwed. You know, we commit everything that we have to potentially becoming actors. We don't have family members who could potentially provide us with, you know, a good job if it all falls through or they know someone who knows someone who could employ us if it doesn't work out for us so they can try it for a few years and it all goes under and then they're still employed elsewhere. For us, it's a case of if we don't make it as actors and we've committed everything that we have to becoming actors, we have nothing to fall back on. We don't have a safety net. I was lucky, through an accident at birth, to be the child of actors, who were also the child of actors. It certainly made connections easier. It's given me a knowledge of um, who people were and how things work. And this is something that doesn't really appear on a balance sheet. But lack of connections and lack of you know, people say it's not 
what you know is who you know. In a well-funded and uh, properly egalitarian profession, that shouldn't be true. It increasingly is. There are no limitations for upper class, middle class, white straight men. There are none. There are none. There are zero. Every single industry apart from sprinting that you see them in, they're, they're, they're the boss or they're the best or they're succeeding or they own it or whatever. Middle class actors are more successful because they are the people that are able to work in the industry consistently over time. Acting is difficult for everybody. It's not an easy profession to be part of. But if actors self-define success as being able to get work, it's clear that the middle class are those who are doing that work. Some people say, why is class left out of the discussions about diversity? People are talking about BAME, they talk about disabled, they talk about other gender issues, but they don't talk about class. Actually, we have a particular worry about class in, 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 in the UK. We don't even like to use the word class. Um, and probably because we're guilty about it, because we actually have probably a more class-ridden society than many other societies around the world. We are very confused, even working class people are very confused about the class structure in this country. And people don't want to talk about it because it's still there and it's still prevalent and it's still controlling and it's still, you know, it, it's, it's devastating. And we won't admit that this country is absolutely rotten to the core with it. Uh, yeah, I'd always wanted to be an actor, um, since a really young age really. I think I wanted to be a singer until my voice broke, and then I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, yeah, kind of about seven or eight I thought that's what I want to do. Um, I never thought it'd be possible, uh, really, as I grew older, because just kind of like the area that I grew up in is, you know, you either work at the hospital, the airport, or one of the industrial estates. So. I kind of didn't know how to do it um, and probably wouldn't have done it, to be honest. I wouldn't have still known how to do it if I hadn't have kind of fell into it because I'd kind of made more realistic plans at 15 um, for, for leaving school. When I was growing up in Bradford, the idea of doing theatre or acting, it just wasn't on the cards. It just wasn't something that was even, you know, an option in terms of a career. I mean, you might do a school play or whatever. Yeah, it was always slightly discouraged because people go, well, you know, we don't know anybody, we don't know how to help, you're not from, you know, the, and it's mainly the people within your own background that say to you, you're not really cut out for this, you're not, my granddad would say, you're not selfish enough to be an actor. Um, and that obviously, you're not from the right class. I was born to a single parent uh, as a mixed race child in the 80s, um, in, a, in a house that, uh, that had no inside toilet, no bath. If I remember correctly, it might not have had hot, and hot running water. It certainly didn't have central heating or anything like that. Uh, I went to school. I had holes in my trousers. I was on three meals. I had a dinner ticket every meal I had. Um, but that felt normal because it felt like that was what most of the kids at my school were like, if I'm honest. Um, I think as I grew up, I became very, very aware of class and what class was and how limiting class can be, how it can hold you in position, unable to, to break free from the shackles of, that, of the class you're born into. Had I not been working class, had I have come from a wealthy family, I would have done a foundation course two years ago. I can't say where I'd be now, I probably could be in drama school. I think I was very aware um of my class identity when I started going to auditions and I would audition with people that their parents would come with them and they'd already been at 10 auditions and it was it was nothing it was fine they could just go to another one if they didn't get into that school or um, whereas I would I would have to work for, for two or three weeks just to pay to, for that audition and mum and dad would always help me out as much as they could like they would pay my train tickets and they would do as much as they can but there's there's only so much that they can give. There are times in my life where I felt ashamed of my class. Uh, there are times when I felt emphatically 
proud of my class, uh, times where I become defiant because of my class and what that tells me about who I am and where I come from and the, and the legacy or the lineage that leads to now and to me. One thing that was really powerful to me as a child was whenever I heard a voice of authority, whenever I heard a voice that was quote unquote intellectual, whenever I heard a voice that was quote unquote cultural, it was white, it was male and it was middle class. Dialect's an important thing. If you sound like me and millions of other people like me from Scotland or Liverpool or wherever, um, you don't necessarily think that your accent denotes uh, creativity or intellect. So you don't think you'll play Hamlet. You know, you think that the properties of being intellectual and poetic and soulful reside in an RP accent. To die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. There was a, a moment in my first year where I was encouraged to speak in RP outside of the rehearsal room and outside of the classroom in order to, for it to become an, a natural way of speaking for me. And, um, and I weren't happy about that and I didn't want to do that. And, uh, and I know a few people who've had that because it's like this is absolutely this voice is very much part of who I am. It's probably the most apart from my big nose, probably the most recognisable thing about me, and it's uh, and it's very tied in with who I am and where I'm from. And even after years spent in London, I never lost my accent at all. And you know, your job as an actor is to be able to step in and out of different characters, and that sometimes involves different dialects. I didn't see any need for myself to pretend to be a different person as I went about my daily business. I now regard RP receive pronunciation as a thing I have to be in my armour, I have to have in my armoury because I think it's important to working class actors that we can act up because we're often getting middle class boys acting down, you know, doing their cockney, doing their northern. So we've got to say to them, well, we can go up. If we are pre-programmed to lead and to innovate, then we'll rise to the top and assume our rightful place at the head of the pack just like the alpha male amongst a band of primates. I'd have known your bloody gorillas would be involved somewhere. <laughs> what about everyone else, Asper? Well? The weak, the old and the useless will fall away. One mustn't be overly sentimental about these things. Come on, I want some supper before I fall away. And keep that bloody... What I'd say to any kid is make sure that you can do RP. Make sure you can do it at drama school, on a film set, in theatre, because then It'll, it'll help you. It's, it's no more or less important. Well, it's less important, let's be honest. RP is less important, <laughs> but culturally it is. But make sure you can do it um, so you can get those roles so they cannot stick you in a box as the oik or the uneducated. I've never played a, a professor. I've never played a lawyer or anything like that. I've played kind of... Uh, People on council estates. I've played, uh, a, I believe, a, a murderer. Um, you know, a, a leader of a motorbike gang, and various different things that, that I guess you could say are kind of um, working class kind of uh, stereotypes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, it's, it is a shame because I'm an actor, and you know, you don't get into acting to play roles that you can play in your sleep. You know, you get into acting to play roles that that challenge you, and um, and make you make you uh, prove to your mum and dad that it is a job, <laughs> and you are doing something with your time. <laughs> if you're a, a, a black guy from a working class background, um, you know, and you've got you've got a London accent or, or, a, or a London patois, the execs and producers and directors who are predominantly white, middle class and upper middle class men, straight men, are gonna pigeonhole you into a place. So if you want to act, there will be roles for you, limited, but they're there. And, and they're usually called Tyrone and a lot of the time they're in jail or 
their servants in costume dramas. I think initially, leaving drama school, there was an advantage because people knew exactly what pigeonhole to put you in. Um, so I left, and luckily, I mean, I was blessed when I left. My first job was, well, I was still at drama school, was playing Twinkling Dinner Ladies. What do you reckon then? Are you really three weeks late? Yeah, I am, Bran. Do you know when it might have, who it was, type thing? Oh, yeah. It's a really nice bloke, actually. We just like watching vids and having a drink and that. He'd done us a frozen pizza. He just took it out of the oven and, you know. <laughs> Did he use protection? Oven mitts. <laughs> So, you know, to work with Victoria Wood was like a, was a dream come true. It wasn't like a dream come true, it was a dream come true. I thought it was something that never happened. But then after that, it did become every character before that was fat, such a body, fat this, fat that. And they were always good time girls, you know, uh, healthy looking good time, because it was a lot bigger then. But it was still very northern, brassy, loud, you know, fun time, you know, prostitutes worked in supermarkets. Again, not that there's anything wrong with that, but there was a definite, I never went for an audition of anybody who had any further education or higher education, because that's how you were seen. If you look at the industry at the moment, it is dominated by white middle-class males, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. I've noticed that working in the television industry. Uh, all the first, second, third assistant directors tend to be male, or to a lesser extent female and white and middle class. So the industry does not say anything to a working class child from a council estate that you're welcome. It didn't say a great deal to me, telling me that I was welcome, but now, you know, it's completely homogenized. The, the people at the top are all white middle class men or white upper class men that are privately school educated and then when they want to hire someone to work for them because of like this anxiety and fear of the images of black people and white working class people as, as thugs and retrobates and, and whatever, they hire themselves because they goes, oh you went to Cambridge, I went to Cambridge, we went to Cambridge, let's all be together. Ultimately, it's about standing in a room full of people who, who you feel are talking a different language, who are wearing a different cut of shirt, uh, who are wearing a different sort of shoe and going, I don't belong here, I don't fit in here, I don't feel right here, it's awkward, uncomfortable, but I want to be here. What do I have to change within me to allow me to exist within this world, in this rarefied, exclusive, elitist world? Um, and theatre is all of those things. Uh, there's some of its biggest flaws, I think. People think of class as an old-fashioned concept, you know, and, and my God, you know, the powers that be have done their best to, to feed that into our culture, saying we're all middle class now, and that, um, you know, there's no such thing as society, and, you know, and with the decimation of, like, factories and pits, etc., that that working class community doesn't exist. But I think if you can give young people a sense of who they are and where they come from and the community that they were born into and have grown up in and a pride in that and a fierce pride in that in the same way as that you would hope to bring up your daughters with a strong sense of femaleness and being a woman and a feminist and as a person of colour as you would hope to bring up your children with a sense of pride about that that it's important that we teach our young people that that is a very important part of who they are. Because I was told indirectly by society it wasn't for me, it created a hunger in me for it that, that, that has sustained me. You know, I, I was, because I felt excluded, I was desperate to get in. And once I was in and I started reading Shakespeare properly, for instance, or reading Ibsen, or reading... I realised that all the great writers, what they actually do is write about inequality. And what all the great writers are doing, and writers are the most important part of, of what I do, what all the great writers are doing are actually giving voice to people who don't have a voice. So they were writing about me. I just didn't realise that until I got inside. When I was about seven or eight, my mum and dad split up and my mum brought me to Eastbourne. 
took me from Manchester and brought me to this one bedroom flat. It was just me, my mum, my nan and my grandpa. This guy, he basically had um, just come out of prison for running over his dad's head um, in his car. So when my mum and my new fellow got together, they used to drink a lot of the time in this pub. So I'd come down here uh, after school, either get the keys or most of the time I have to do my homework or do my studies in, on one of these tables. Um, cause, probably because of that I wasn't put many GCSEs or anything like that. moved in with us, lived with us, and we used to play fight, sort of. Sometimes he'd, like, he'd take it a, like, a step too far, and that really hurt me. I put my hand right up behind my back and whatever, and proper get up in my face about it. And all this while my mum's not in the room sort of thing, so it's quite hard when you think back on it. When I came home from school one time when they weren't at the pub, I could hear my mum crying upstairs. So I shouted up and was like, is everything okay? And she was like, just go away, just go away. I could just hear the, the tears and the banging. Just went to the front room, put something on the telly, it was like SpongeBob or something. Um, and I could still hear everything going on upstairs. It was just getting louder and louder and louder. I rang my nan, told her what was going on. She said, I'll be around, I'll be around in a minute. She came through the door. She kind of went halfway up the stairs and was like, what's going on, what's going on? Uh, and, he, and him and my mum were going, fuck off, fuck off. And then this fucking beast of a man just came straight out the door. I remember him literally diving over the banister of the stairs. Literally like a forward roll down the stairs. My nan obviously took a step back and he just pinned her up against the wall. I was in the front room crying and screaming. My mum was like locking me in so I couldn't see it. But I could, because it was quite frosted glass, I could still see the blurred images of what was going on. And him just literally having my nan pinned up against the wall. And I think from that point on, I was just like, I can't live in this environment anymore. So when I went back to my dad's for the holidays, I just remember I was sitting in the kitchen and I told him the story and I just broke down in tears and was just like, I think I'm going to stay with you. From there he enrolled me into new school and put me into the after school clubs. So I started playing the rugby, started doing more academic classes, like after school classes to kind of catch me up because obviously I wasn't predicted any GCSEs. And then eventually got me involved in the drama classes and he saw that I was doing well in that and we did a few school productions. Then he put me into the Octagon stagecoach. I guess I'm, that's why I'm kind of here today in, in terms of that's how I started as an actor. Tonight's the actual awareness, official actual awareness launch party, which is really exciting. We've got 12 different acts, we've got singers, we've got comedians, and um, we've got some of our previous Scratch Night pieces on tonight. And just really showcase what actual awareness really is and get actual awareness on the map, which is obviously the, uh, the end of what we're trying to do. I'm running like a headless chicken because I've got about three texts to try and do in an hour. And yeah, now I'm going to go get suited and booted and ready for tonight.
were so many working class actors, there were so many actors, writers, directors who just needed help. And I thought that I need to bring these people together, one, so I could help them, but two, that they could help each other. I think Tom Stocks is fantastic because, you know, there's a lot of people screaming and shouting about diversity and, you know, working class actors. And he's just took the initiative, really, and just said, you know what, I'm going to create something. And in creating something, he's actually helping other people. And it's just moving along, really snowballing, where people have said it's a bit of a hashtag before. But actually, it's not hashtag because he's actually working, helping other actors work. I'm quite hard working and quite motivated and driven but it's so tricky unless you got a ton of cash it's really hard um i've been kind of saving up and putting my own stuff on but it takes a lot of time to kind of get the sort of money together to put a show on um so actual awareness are giving kind of frequent um showcases so we get to put stuff on kind of every couple of months it is nice that there's things like actual awareness where where people like tom encourage you to say you know build create and here we are and we'll help you promote as well and you, you get that friendship from it which is and that sense of community which is very difficult to find in london i find without actual awareness i would probably just still be working front of house in a theater um, and from that saving up to try and put i guess a show on every year or every two years. I, I wanted to go to drama school, but they're, they're too expensive. And when I went to uni, it was, you know, it was three grand a year. If it was nine grand, which it is now, realistically, I probably wouldn't have gone. I would have, I would have stayed in Peterborough. I found it quite difficult in that I didn't go to drama school. I've done a couple of foundation courses and scraped the money together by working three jobs. <laughs> so, I think it is much harder for working class people to kind of get started unless you've got that initial like financial injection. It was never like a thing that you thought about seriously. People might say, oh, you're good at acting, like you should do something like that. And I just thought it was silly. I thought I've got to go get a proper job. Um, and I had no family that could financially put me through living at drama school in London. I come from a single parent family. My mum's got four kids and she can't really say, oh, I'll put you through drama school. <laughs> and then she, with the rest of us would have to starve. It's going to make, if you open up the doors to different kinds of people, diversity, class, you can have more people watching your things. So people, it's representation. People are going to go, oh, I can relate to that person. That's an extra person watching your TV show. You know, just open the doors. You know, what's the problem? Why is everyone so scared to try something new? This is Salford Arts Theatre, where I've been coming for around four years now. And I do drama classes on a Saturday for three hours. When I leave school, my ambition is to become an actress. Too often now, uh Certainly access to theatre for young people is becoming a bit elitist um, and it's important in our area to give young people the opportunity to act and realise some of the dreams because when you've got nothing else, dreams are kind of what you live on. The last time I went to the theatre was with school. They um, took us to the Laura to watch a play called I Am Thomas and they paid for it. And it made me, it made me feel happy because school, they don't usually don't usually do anything to do with drama. They try and they don't go any further with it than just lessons. So it was nice for once that they was taking an interest in drama and giving us the opportunity to go and see a play. And basically we, um, we teach um, the children and young people a technique with Within, within acting and um, they work towards a performance. So they usually do two performances a year, two full productions uh, within a year and we do a range of stuff. So they either devise their own work um, or they work on published plays. In school we can do drama as a GCSE but it's not taken as seriously as the other options. So we don't even have a proper drama teacher, it's the English teacher doing drama. I've just really struggled to get into any kinds of acting job that's paid because a lot of them want you to work for free or um, just donate your time basically it's a passion and a choice and something that you that you go you're going in to do but it takes up so much of your life um, it 
it's not just two hours on the stage it's you know rehearsals for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and I'd find myself like 12 hours a day being in rehearsals and then coming home and then reading through my scripts to make sure that they were right and all of this time I wasn't able to work get money and obviously I've got rent to pay I've got bills got foods need to buy foods and clothes and you know just the, the, the necessities really in life and you can't do that when you're working for free for 12 hours a day <laughs> um, and then going home to do the same so it kind of became a I'm gonna have to give this up and get a job you genteel twats don't get it you've got no fucking idea how to let go fuck me loosen your stiff upper lip Rip out the taste of your silver spoon. Go extreme, go mental. Forget your sentimental self. Mm. Test yourself and disregard your health. It's just really disheartening that I have never given up on anything else in my life and now all of a sudden, you know, I find myself going down a completely different route and I don't really think that's through any fault of my own. I think that's just because of the system really and that I've come from a really working class background and I've got no money. Um, to go and pay to get into this private acting school or whatever and I've just, that's just the way it is, so. But yeah, it's really upsetting and really disheartening sometimes. Uh, my last acting job, what is in like, I got paid for, um, non-existent, really, yeah. Lots of unpaid, lots of unpaid, but yeah. I've never been paid for an acting job. I mean, the perks of being a waitress is the zero hour contract. So I can say, I need this off here, I need this off there, I need this off here. But also it can mean that your hours can fluctuate or they can go down. You have no control of how many hours you work at the same time. This one day I didn't notice, but uh, This Is England had been out about a year and it was in the bargain bin for about three pound, which is a bargain. And um, someone brought it over to the counter and like put it down to buy it and just kind of pointed at it and went, is, is that you? I was like, yeah, that's me. And he's like, what, what are you doing there? Like, what, what are you doing behind a counter in Asda? And I was like, <laughs> to me, that just sums up, you know, this whole thing, this whole like kind of working class uh, actor and, and people's mentality and not understanding it is people instantly think if you're on the TV or if you're, you're on film or anything like that, that you've kind of made it. I'm very northern and I like that. I don't want to keep that. I don't want to become a product of something or someone else. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day I'll go to London, but for now, I'm quite happy in Manchester. Actors live in London, that's what you do. There's the, I'd kind of grown up with this mentality that, you know, after, after a while of acting, you have to be in London because that's where everything's at. And um, I lived there for about nine or 10 months, just on the outskirts, just Essex way. It was so expensive to live there. Um, and uh, community as well. Um, I, I went with this idea that I'd be constantly surrounded by other actors and, 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 and things like that. And I just, I just wasn't, I didn't see that many people and I kind of missed my community of, of just friends and family who had grown up with. The BBC as well, like, as much as it's moved up, the no up north, like, I, I, like, you search line, search line, search line, you never see any open auditions, any auditions, I never, I've never been sent one through from my agent, but there must be stuff going on, but you don't hear about it unless maybe you're with the right agent, or even on Spotlight, I never seem to see anything, so it's kind of like, I thought these opportunities would be created by them moving up north, and then it's kind of like, well, where are they? You can't find them. I mean, Peter Flannery, who did Our Friends in the North, told me that the, the then controller of the BBC said to him, uh, are you sure you want North in the title? <laughs> are you sure you want North in your title? And that was in 1993. And uh, it's only got worse since. Thank you.
So we're here at the kind of like prestigious school of Eton. Um, I mean, this is home to Hugh Laurie, um, Tom Hiddleston, Eddie Redmayne, uh, Damien Lewis, all those kind of plethora of actors that are currently dominating TV and film. They're all winning Oscars, BAFTAs, um, things like that, um, and they're all coming from schools like Eton. It's £35,000 a year to come here. 7% of the population is privately educated. And then you look at the top jobs, things like, like the arts, like politics, um, in the media, they're all, the top jobs are dominated by these privately educated kids. I presume a class has just ended. So I mean, when you compare this to an everyday secondary school, here they have um, a 400 seat theatre, they have um, kind of in-house directors, they have, uh, they can do up to 30 productions a year in this place, and also two studio theatres. So, I mean, when you think about you're paying the 35,000 and you're paying for the theatre, you're paying for all that, you're also paying for the connections because from such an early age, they're put in front of casting directors and industry professionals uh, on, on their stage. And you're paying for those connections that they have. I mean, the old term is, it's not what you know, it's who you know. When you kind of have rich parents, you can afford to not have another job on the side as well. So when you come out of these sort of schools, you can have that flexibility to just sit there and dedicate your full time to acting and not have a call centre job like I do on the side. I can't focus my time on things because I haven't got mummy and daddy to pay for it. You know, I was at um, Lambda with people uh, from Eton and Harrow who were really lovely people and it's really important to say that that it, this isn't a you know it's not class bashing in terms of like the other people they were born into what they were born into and and you know certainly the people that i worked with and and went through training with were some of the loveliest people i've ever met but there is a certain confidence uh, that's much discussed now that comes from that kind of education and being told from a very young age that you are the future that you are the leaders that your voice has a right to be heard in a way that perhaps uh, a girl from accrington might not naturally feel to a middle class your average middle class family going to the national theater going to the ballet going to a classical concert it's just you know a nice night out with dinner and drinks and you know a little bit of culture but for somebody from a working class background doing that is a way out of a certain way of life my, i mean my parents both of whom came from Salford, started full-time work at 14, 40 hours a week at 14 and more, um, were given purposefully a rudimentary education. They've never wanted the working class to have any power. They don't want us educated. They definitely don't want us to have any artistic inspiration. What happened to me when I discovered art when I properly discovered art and what it was about, it was a way out for me. It was so if I go to a theatre or a film or, or anything, I'm not looking to just be pre pleasantly diverted for two or three hours. I'm not saying that doesn't have its place, but I'm looking to be uh, enlightened and, and um, um, and moved and, and, and informed. I think the problem is uh, this sort of culture of thinking that art is a, a plaything, it's a leisure activity. It's something that rich people do in their spare time. So you'll go and do a little bit of acting and you'll go to the theater or go to the opera or go to the dance. And, and, it's, and, it's, and for working class people and for people from um, underprivileged backgrounds, that's a luxury that can't be afforded. Imagine being, I don't know, 10 years of age thinking, God, I'd love to be an actor, but that will never ever happen for you because there is no route forward for you. And because that stops at school, 
because your family don't have the resources to support you going to the theatre, but you don't know where that would begin. Maybe even theatre is not part of your school's curriculum anymore because the arts aren't as valid as they used to be inside of schools. As this generation comes through, you can't afford arts training, you don't have the opportunities, even at school now, to do the wide range of art subjects that were available even in my time. You know, we've kind of gone through the golden age between me leaving school and now I think where there was a lot of art subjects where suddenly you could do photography and dance as GCSEs. Now we're in a period where those things are being taken away again. The playwright Finn Kennedy has a great phrase. He says that nurturing creativity in the young is like installing the software on which all the other stuff will run. Studying drama not only gives you an idea of what that is, but it gives you articulacy, a sense of emotional intelligence, self-confidence, stage presence, empathy, uh, an understanding of conflict, a way of working together collaboratively, an amazing feeling of being part of something that's bigger than you are. Had I not discovered theatre, had I not uh, found a vent for my frustrations, for my angst, for my difficulties in expressing myself, had I not been able to step out of myself for a moment and become someone else and, and play and release, uh, I, it was very possible that I could have gone down a path that would have led me somewhere very different to where I am now. I went to a really rough comprehensive school uh, where there were certain things that just weren't okay to be. Like being a thespian, you were considered queer. If you were gay, like, God help you, man. It was a really homophobic, quite dangerous place. Um, and you go to the Brit school, and all of a sudden, all of those things are fine. And it's not, it's not elitist in the fact that you have to pay for it. It's an equal, op equal opportunity school. So you walk in, and there's, like, the ethnic diversity that I was used to being from Peckham. And there's these kids that are 14 years old, proud and gay and out. And I, I, think, I think that's a really important thing because if, if that is acceptable there, it kind of opens the door to everything being acceptable and open. Um, so I had like four years of not fearing that I'd have to fight somebody about who I was to absolutely just explore being an actor. And, and that's kind of what I thought acting was, like this equal, beautiful, creative hub. Um, and then I was a, a little bit shocked when, when I went to drama school. <laughs> I think one of the things that we have now is a sort of sometimes a discussion about talent which says, oh, you're gifted, you're born with it, it will, it will come. Well, it won't come if you're not given a place where that can be nurtured. It won't come if there's not a place where you can be looked after and cared for and encouraged. And often where that encouragement happens is in schools. Uh, and often where that happens is in clubs after schools or a local drama society, for instance. And if those things don't exist anymore, or don't exist in a way that gives everyone access to them, then I think more and more people will be denied an opportunity to explore that. The Creative Industries Federation, one of our big umbrella organisations, has recently said that we are facing a crisis in creativity. We're being taught by the government that these subjects are not useful and they won't earn you any money. And since they've put us all into debt, not earning very much money is a, is a real problem. But all of those skills, the creativity, the empathy, the emotional intelligence, the ability to work together, they make you a much better bus driver, they make you a much better librarian, they make, make, make you a much better lawyer or CEO. I mean, it, it's not just, the thing is though, isn't it, it's not just about getting into drama school and drama training. If any young working class person now wanting to do, you know, pursue any career that involves any form of further education, they're screwed. The industry is massively like, it's like a little nucleus of, uh, of, of this kind of like privately educated all these people here and what what we what we say what we preach is that it's for everyone and what we practice is it's for just these tiny these little people here in the middle and it will again be the preserve of the ruling classes and i use that word 
very carefully. The ruling classes, the people who run the country, the people who have the power already. And yes, they might now and again want to talk about social issues from a distance, but those stories have to come from the communities. The problem is that when you haven't got enough positive reflection, you don't have enough different faces, you don't have enough stories, it excludes people. And they think this isn't for me, it's just posh. And that's not true. And it's not true at all, especially with things like Shakespeare. And Shakespeare wasn't posh. He wasn't an aristocrat. His dad made gloves. His plays are twice as old as America. So if you're born into that inheritance, he's yours. He belongs to all of us. That voice is one that we want to hear coming out of everybody's mouth. Yeah, man, Shakespeare belongs to you way more than it belongs to anyone else. Shakespeare is written for us, <laughs> like whoever us is. And I think it's way more, uh, it speaks way more to like black, Asian and white working class people than it does to anybody else. Gentlemen, good evening. A word with one of you. Um, but one word with one of us. Couple it with something. Make it a word and a blow. You shall find me apt enough to that, sir. And you will give me occasion. Could you not take some occasion without giving? There's something about the language, right? And there's something that enables the audience to hear it for the first time again. Not just to hear lovely words, like with the best THs and INGs at the end, but to hear the sense of it. Why bastard? Wherefore base? When my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous and my shape as true, as honest, madam's issue. Why brand nails? With base? With baseness? Bastardy? Base? Base. The access of emotions, like in here, I think working class and, and ethnic minorities, right, this is a generalisation and I get thrown under the bus for saying this, have a massive access to their guttural emotions that hasn't been limited by social statuses on how you must behave, what fork and what knife to use, what dinner jacket you have to wear. It's just like, this is how I feel and here it is. And if you give them the words of Shakespeare to articulate those feelings, you have magic, man, absolute magic. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. There's never a, a lead actor uh, from a working class background playing Hamlet, for instance, in, in London, nor is there a person of colour. I mean, Maxine Peake had to do a Hamlet, fantastic to see that happen, but it had to happen in Manchester. Accept my life. Accept my life. She wouldn't have been given that opportunity in London. And the fact is, whether we like it or not, our country and our culture is metrocentric. So we look at London as a barometer. And what London's saying is you're not wanted. You're not important. We don't care about you. You're not interesting, you don't, you know, it's a boys club, an exclusive boys club. Am I getting angry now? I want to be with you, even through my dreams. And as the time goes by, you stay by my side, a man Oh, blimey, it's so good. Mrs. Crosby, yeah. um, actually, I'm a certificate in bailiff. Oh, and I've come to. Are you are, Mrs. Crosby? Yeah. yeah. I'm here with you. There's 262 pounds owing. I must advise that I've got to collect this now. I can't 
Oh, the Queen, the Queen. Turn the Queen the other way, you bloody communist. Turn her up, that. The right way up, the Queen. There was definitely a generation of filmmakers and writers who had benefited, people like Dennis Potter, Jim Allen, who had benefited from the kind of revolution of the 60s and Wilson's government and all that. So they were foregrounding working class lives. That, that bled on to a certain extent at the BBC and to a lesser extent the ITV in the early part of the 80s as Thatcher started to bite. And of course, the great example of that is Bleasdale's Boys from the Black Stuff, which was 81. Uh, only two years into the destruction of um, the manufacturing, manufacturing industries in this country, the great plan. Oh, it's fine by me. You make a joke out of it. But be warned, the way things are going with this government, the swing to the right, tax relief for the rich, redundancies for the poor, mass unemployment, poverty, curtailing of freedom, starting with the unions. It's all heading for one thing and one thing only, a fascist dictatorship and a police state. You look at the dramas that were allowed to be produced and that reflected the times, you know, Boys from the Black stuff. You look at a lot of the Jim Allen stuff, the, you know, plays for today's with 60, 70, 80. Look at those things now, they're not allowed. Nothing with any, any potent political content is let anywhere near the BBC or ITV or even Channel 4 now. I mean, that's obviously my television career over now, but you know what I mean? Where are those reactions to what's happening? One of the interesting things that's happened recently with the more global reach of television is that our programmes now are being very popular in America. But on the whole, they're programmes that are largely set in the class system and seen from an aristocratic point of view. Countess Rostova, may I request the pleasure of a dance with your daughter, Natalia? Of course. She'll be delighted. So the stuff that we export is War and Peace, which isn't even an English story, you know, but it's about, it's about posh people, so it'll do. Or Mr. Selfridge, which I was in, uh, which has an American tie-in, but is, you know, largely uh, set among middle-class shoppers. And, um, or, or Downton, which is, you know, massively, massively successful. We all knew we were all on the rocky road to hell when Downton became one of the biggest TV shows on television, didn't we? That people were buying into this, you know, Julian Fellow's absolute nonsense about the, you know, the aristocrats, the upper classes. You know, I'm not saying there were some families who maybe did look after the servants and there were, but really? If you're a producer or a director trying to enter the industry, if you say, oh, I want to I wanna do um, a six-part series about Salford, you're not going to get it. But if you say you're going to do Poldark or you're going to do, you know, um, uh, what's that thing called? Down Turd Abbey, you know, you're, you're in. They're not really a full picture of Britain in all its diversity and modernity now. They're very backward looking. Um, they're quite often to do with kings and queens, uh, which, you know, is, is interesting. But again, you can't learn to be a king or a queen. It's an accident of birth. Since 1979 in Reagan and Thatcher, we have mirrored America. We have set America up, um, the biggest capitalist country in the world, as our example, both economically, politically and culturally. So, yeah, what they like about us is the royal family. So... That's what we flog them. And, but what's interesting about what's happened is America are now making the best television in the world. And they're doing it by doing what they did with their film industry in the 70s with people like Tony Soprano or the guy in, in Breaking Bad. They're creating an American character who has become corrupted by their system. You clearly don't know who you're talking to, so let me clue you in. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot, and you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. So we're now buying all their television, which is basically 
a critique of their own society. We're not doing any critiques of our society. We're just doing massive 20-part series about Queen Elizabeth. Monarchy is God's sacred mission to grace and dignify the earth, to give ordinary people an ideal to strive towards, an example of nobility and duty to raise them in their wretched lives. Monarchy is a calling from God. That is why you're crowned in an abbey, not a government building, why you're anointed, not appointed. It's an archbishop that puts the crown on your head, not a minister or public servant, which means that you are answerable to God in your duty, not the public. So when I came away from East 15 and I found out that moment that I had to defer my place for the second time, um, and the realisation kind of kicked in that I wouldn't be able to go to drama school because I couldn't afford it. Um, from then, obviously, we created actor awareness and built a community of people that didn't think they had a voice or didn't think that there was people in the same boat as them. And we've, I hope we have, I think, I know we have, we've brought them together. We've even touched down in Manchester now, um, which is what I wanted. I, I'm just fed up with everything being so London-centric and London was always going to be my guinea pig and now I can really tackle the working class communities of Manchester. We want to go to Birmingham, we want to go to um, Scotland, Newcastle, Liverpool. We want to tackle all those things, which is going to take time. But I know what I've achieved in London and I know that I can go forward. Acting is something that I think a lot of people aspire to. Um, and it's a, a real crime actually that only one social group is allowed to have its aspirations uh, fulfilled by this cultural profession. I think it matters that the profession is dominated by one class because we're storytellers. This is what we do for a living. We reflect society. We put a mirror in front of people. And if you're only showing one element, one group, you're doing the rest of the country a disservice. You're doing the rest of the people a disservice. We, as the theatre makers, as the filmmakers, as the storytellers, it is our duty to tell the stories of everybody within this country. We live in an amazingly diverse country, you know, which is its plus point, you know, and we have to tell those stories. The problem is you walk through diverse streets and when I say diverse I'm not talking about ethnicity, I'm talking about richness, richness of experience and variety and you walk along in this, in this world of variety and then you walk through these double doors into an enclave, into a protected, rarefied world where only a particular sort of human being exists or feel they can exist uh, and we as makers, creators, writers, architects of these stories, uh, of the buildings that host these stories, have to do everything we can to remove those barriers. The more of us that are on screen, playing diverse roles and, and stage, the better this industry will become, the more honest the stories will become. All art is political. To create a work of art is a political act. It's just, it just is because it changes things. Um, if art is coming from one very narrow part of society, then the stories and the conversations are only going to be coming from that place and they're only going to be about that place. We need to tell stories to progress, to move forward, but to understand each other. And to be honest, any great cultural movement, as far as I'm concerned, has always started from working class culture. And then the middle classes come and nick it and then stick a price tag on it. And then we have to pay a lot of money for it. Whilst uh, there are really serious questions about, uh, say, white male working class people um, and their ability to get on in the acting industry, the kinds of barriers encountered by, say, black female uh, working class origin people in the acting industry are even higher and are even more difficult to get over. Because you have two bars against you. You have being black, which is exotic and is, is a limited view for our industry and you have being working class which connects you to the to I don't know like crime and council estate so that's where they see you it's hard to aspire in acting it's make-believe but 
they can't believe that we can make something different out of ourselves. The media world is a boys' own club or even, you know, women's own club now, it's certain people from certain universities that rule the roost. So they're hiring all, you know, they will hire their own. We need that working, we need a working class club, to be honest, that then we can all sort of hire each other and then there'll be a good mix then and all the stories, you know, that need to be told being told. I think that it is always in the interests of the people with stuff to keep hold of that stuff. Uh, it's important to them to be able to feel okay about the inequality that their lifestyles are causing and um, and I think we have a culture that is the product of that and reinforces it constantly. You know one of the things that studying drama has allowed me to do is go where did all that stuff go <laughs> and who's got it? And it's changing other people's attitudes, it's changing people in charge, their attitude, you know what I mean? Get out your coffee shops in Crouch End and go and have a look at other places. Really see how the world ticks. You know, when you're all up in arms about Brexit, get out to other parts of the country and go and see how other people are living and then you might understand your own country instead of sitting in your nice little bubble, you know, with your organic bread. Um, you really need, you know, we need to educate ourselves as a country to how this country works and the people that live in this country, you know, and that's the only way that we're ever going to really change things. And that just because you're white and middle class and educated does not mean you know best. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.